You're listening to certified financial planner, Doug Goldstein, host of the Goldstein on Gelt show, www.goldsteinongelt.com. Okay, I'm very excited to be talking to Billy and Acacia Caterley, who are actually not sitting next to me in Jerusalem, but rather they are in Guatemala because they retired there about 400 years ago. No, I'm kidding. But a couple of decades ago, they retired and traveled around. And I guess the first question is, guys, why did you retire so young? Well, Billy and I were working so many hours a week. We put in 60, 80 hour work weeks and we weren't really seeing each other very much. And our relationship started to suffer. Billy came up with this idea, basically, that we could possibly retire on our investments and not have to work at all and travel the world. I thought it was kind of a crackpot idea, but he was pretty convincing, and we took about two years to plan it all out and then yanked the chain and left. (laughs) At that point, how many years were you married? Um, A dozen or 15. Ah, So you knew by that time he wasn't actually a crackpot. You just... (laughs) 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 <laughs> no, he's a genius. He really is. The jury's still out on that one. He is a genius, <laughs> right. which I appreciate, but sometimes he's a little ahead of me and I don't get how it's all related. So, Billy, you were actually a Wall Street guy. I mean, you, you really knew about investing, and I'm trusting you still do know about investing. You were a, a branch manager for a major brokerage firm at the time. What were you thinking in terms, not what were you thinking, but what were you thinking in terms of how you would structure your investments so that from what age was it that you retired? 38. We retired when we were 38 years old. So how do you think you'd structure your investments to go from 38 till, you know, till the end? You know, right at the end of my career, I was learning about no load mutual funds and low expense uh, index funds. And so we started pouring everything we can into the S&P 500 index. And this was in a mutual fund at that time. Today, there's ETFs that I use. It's just easier for me. But um, like SPY and VTI, Vanguard Total Inc., uh, Total Market Fund. And so what we did is, you know, I did a lot of projections on this, and I, I figured out what we'd been making per year on the market, and I figured out if we could live on 3 to 4% of that, allow 3 to 4% of that for inflation, we were covered. So that's a total of 6 to 8% you thought you'd make in the market? Yes, pretty much so. And since we retired, well, on the day we retired, the S&P 500 closed at 312.49. 312.49. <laughs> Today, what is it, 2,400 and something? I don't even wow, know. Exactly. Wow, wow. So, right, so, so we'll, yeah. it's a 7.8% return annually, plus a couple percent for dividends. So we've picked up about 10% a year just being in the S&P 500. So are you richer today than when you retired, uh, how, however many years ago that was? Yes, quite a bit more and uh, much more financially stable. That's ahead of inflation and spending. So when you started, you were 38. Now, I'm a little bit older than 38 now, too, but I, I've seen a few crashes in the market. I wouldn't be prepared to retire now. I would just say, you know, at this point, in order to retire out, I think I'd, if I did it at such a young age, I'd need to put a lot of money into the stock market, but I'd be afraid of a major collapse. How did you deal with that fear? Well, when I was working as a broker, I went through the 87 crash, and I saw how that came back. And, and then also... Um, Since we retired, we've gone through the 99 crash, the 2000 Y2K issues, and then 2008, 2009 uh, financial mess. And, you know, you just got to kind of gut it up a bit. Um, We, You know, I'm getting better at gutting it up. It's not easy. I can tell you that. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I kind of always looked at it. If that if there was a 50 percent correction in the market, could I still handle it? Could we survive? Mm -hmm. And the answer has always been yes. And so that's the way I kind of looked at this thing, that I could handle a 50% drop and uh, knowing that it's not going to last down there, knowing that this is going to be a, you know, a temporary situation. Now, temporary could be six months to a year. I don't know. But uh, oh, it you know, could, the market could even be longer. No it one could, knows. What's your, what, what was your asset allocation when you started when you were young? 100% long in the S&P 500. Wow. Well, and today? But today we're about 60% long. And it's a little bit more diversified. Of the, we own uh, SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF, BTI, a DDY, a dividend play on the Dow, and then a couple other smaller positions. And what's the 40%? We're about 60% long right at the moment. I'd like to increase it. Myself, like everybody else, seems to be waiting for a dip that <laughs> uh, we haven't had since February of, of a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, since then, the market's up 34%. Got it. So that 40% that you've got, is that just sitting in cash waiting to be deployed? 
Yes. Interesting. Wow. That's uh, so. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death. I'm not always say scared. To death. <laughs> <laughs> you, you understand. <laughs> I am. Um, I'm nervous about the bonds market. Is is the Fed's raising interest rates? And, right. And so I'm, i you know, I've got a preferred ETF called PFF, Peter Frank Frank, and it pays around six percent month, and it pays monthly, not six percent a month, but annually six percent. And my point is, is I'm kind of using that as a money market uh, substitute for the time being. But I'm ready to pull the trigger on that thing as soon as I uh, see some uh, troubles with, uh, you know, if the Fed starts raising rates too fast. But but so far, they've telegraphed everything and the market's been able to absorb them. So I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm watching for to increase our equity exposure at some point. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Billy and Acacia Caterley, who retired at the age of 38. They've been explaining to us, first of all, why they retired, which was just to to improve their relationship and get out of the rat race of, well, being in the rat race, which is just so difficult for many, many people, fully understandable. So you retired, you put all your money into the stock market. I guess you kind of had a big prayer and hoped it would work out. And then what'd you do? What was the next thing you did the next day? Well, the next day we went to a Nevis, Nevis West Indies in the Caribbean. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the Caribbean, but it's a very laid back, slow living, slow moving place. I wanted to go someplace where I'd hit a wall. I didn't want to be tempted or to, to get back into the business because I've seen other guys retire and then six months later they're being asked to do something else. And I didn't want mm -hmm. that. I wanted to, I wanted to go down and live the island life. So we lived six months on Nevis. And I always have a saying that on Nevis, if you want hamburger today, you'd better order it yesterday because that's how slow it is. <laughs> that is very slow. Let's talk about other things that are slow because you mentioned something before in terms of interest rates and they, that you think that they may be pushed up a little bit by the Fed, sort of in a slow but announced way, meaning the Fed is announcing their intentions and then they're doing it. And as such, you mentioned that you were happy to have money in a preferred stock fund. PFF, you mentioned, was the... So a preferred stock fund normally acts very much like a long-term bond fund in terms of how it reacts to interest rates. First off, can you explain that and then explain why you're not really worried about that? Well, I didn't say I wasn't worried about it. I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it well, does. Why do you act, sell it now? Maybe <laughs> it does act like a long-term bond, and and that's why that's why I'm concerned about it. You know, we were sitting in cash for a while, and I was looking for some uh, money market substitute, and I discovered this ETF PFF, and I and it since it pays on a monthly basis, there's cash flow, and so I thought I would give that a shot to put a, a you know a portion of our cash investments into it. But I'm like I monitor it every day, and if it starts to slide, I'll I'm I'll be happy to get out, but. Like for the year so far, I don't know, I'm up about, uh, I don't know, five or six percent in it. And uh, so that's the dividend plus the gain. So you're just, you're sort of the so far so good model and you're prepared to jump ship as soon as it no longer looks good to you. On, on that position, yes. Now on our index funds, I no, the one I wouldn't touch them. Those are just for long term and you get some dividends out of it. Do you use only dividend income now to live or do you also, do you look at the total return and you might sell off positions in order to raise capital to cover expenses? Right. We used to sell off positions from the total return, but as we've aged, we're 65 now. And so we're, we're drawing Social Security. So between dividends and Social Security, we make up more than enough of our spending. So we, we don't How have to How much do you get for Social board. Security since you didn't actually work till 65, like most people do? Well, the U.S. rules for Social Security are that you need 40 quarters. So if you work for 40 quarters and you make, I don't know, 600 bucks in a quarter or something like that, um, you qualify for Social Security. So are you just making like the minimum amount? No, no, we, you know, because I made a pretty good salary. In the case, you made a pretty mm -hmm. good salary. We, you know, we, we got a, I don't know, I don't know if we're average or above average or what it is, but I mean, we don't make the maximum that people make today, but uh, we stopped working 26 years ago. Yeah, so your two income sources are Social Security and drawing at the moment dividends from your portfolio. Correct. And, and you got, chose to live. Excuse me, Doug. I, I, we wrote a piece on our website. I came up with this idea on how to double your Social Security, and that's by buying dividend growth stocks and so that your dividends can match your Social Security payment. And so now all of a sudden you got twice as much Social Security coming in. But, you know, if you start this when you're young and dividend reinvestments, you can amass uh, quite a dividend portfolio. So if you met someone today who was 38 years old and said, you know, I'm thinking of doing what you did, you would presumably ask him, well, how much money do you have? Because that would be the test to see whether he could actually retire. How much money do you think someone, a 38-year-old today, would need to retire and then live live like you're for the rest of his life? I would say very comfortably on a million. We did it with half of that. 
<laughs> but that was, you know, like I said, back three, almost three decades ago now. And you've been living outside the United States the whole time? No, 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 no. We have a residence in Arizona. Oh, no kidding. So how much time do you spend in the U.S.? I, you know, saying I, I apologize because all along I was thinking this whole model works if you're willing to move to a, a really low price jurisdiction. But that's not the case. Well, yes, no, it does work. It works better in this type of situation. We've spent a lot of time in Thailand, Vietnam, Mexico and in Guatemala mm -hmm. the last few years. But can someone do this in America if someone doesn't actually want to leave? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We know people there doing it. In Arizona, our place there and the situation that we were living there is one of our lower cost of living for the year. We live in an active adult community. It's a resort. And so we have social outlets and swimming pools and workout rooms and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we own our, our little manufactured home. Food prices are good and all that sort of thing. And it was one of our lower prices of living anywhere in the world. It's definitely doable. And when you're traveling and overseeing this, do you have to spend a lot of time dealing with your investments or it's just kind of set on autopilot? You have your 60-40 split. If something changes, you'll make an adjustment and then you just get on with your life? The short answer is no, because I was in the business, as you know, and so it's, <laughs> it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a hobby to me. And I like to stay abreast of, sure. it, of what's going on because I also like to, in the morning I have coffee with guys and we all, you know, BS about everything, and, and I try to steer conversations to financial, and it really surprises me how poorly educated these guys are, and they're, they're international. They're Australians and Germans and mm -hmm. Dutch and Americans and Canadians, um, and I just it surprises me how little financial literacy they have, and luckily they're where they are. Yeah, and no, I'm going to say, luckily, there's a way for them to learn about it. And I see, actually, we, we are running a little bit over time. But tell me, one of the places I know that people can learn about retiring early is from you. And of course, as your the logo or the slogan on your website says, you guys have the idea for retirement like your parents, but way cooler. So in the last few seconds, tell us, how can people follow you and follow your work? Uh, from our website, retireearlylifestyle.com, we answer all correspondence as we can get, get to them. And uh, we have a free newsletter that you can subscribe to. That's right on our homepage. And uh, drop us a line. We'd be happy to, to uh, help in any way we can. All right. We will put links to that at the show notes of today's show. Billy and Acacia Caterley, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank, Thank you, you, Doug. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Check out all of Doug's money ideas at goldsteinongelt.com. Doug specializes in helping people who live outside the United States handle their U.S. investment accounts. If you have a question that you would like answered on the air or off, contact Doug at his website or send him an email to doug at profile-financial.com.